Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fourth episode of Dojo Talk. This is the BA Martial Artist coming to you with my amazing friend and colleague, Robert Thacker, to discuss process mining and process automation. If you recall, Robert was our special guest for episode three, where we discussed the process, and I'm very happy to have him back again. For those who may be joining us for the first time this year, we've been focused on six different levels of perspectives you can leverage to understand your organization. So far, we have discussed four of those perspectives. We've discussed the organization as a whole, the customer experience, the process, and business rules. Our last two perspectives of the system and data will come later this year. If you want to find out more, follow my blog post on my website at www.paulaabell.com. But let's talk a little bit about Robert. For nearly 20 years, Robert has managed the successful implementation of process improvement projects for many different organizations. These projects aided in the release of new products and refined existing processes, saving millions of dollars. He firmly believes that your processes are at the center of everything you do. If you don't understand your process, you don't understand your business. Robert has worked with customers in financial services, healthcare, government, and manufacturing, teaching them how to better understand the services they as a company provide to improve their customer experiences and to make the connection to the processes that drive them. There's no one better I would love to do this segment with than Robert. So sit back, relax, and get ready for episode four of Dojo Talk. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to episode four of Dojo Talk. I'm here again with my great friend and colleague, Robert Thacker. You will remember Robert from our last Dojo Talk episode, number three, where he gave us a ton of insight on process mapping, process modeling, what is a process, why is having processes documented important, and all of that great stuff. And by the way, Robert, just to let you know, I did receive quite a bit of positive feedback on how great that session was and how the information you shared was so beneficial. So uh, great job on that. Oh, well, excellent. Thank you. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad people enjoyed it. I'm glad they got something out of it. Appreciate it. Glad to be back. Okay. I'm glad to have you back. As you know, I love talking to you anyway, and you have that great voice anyway. So it just goes well with videos, right? <laughs> So, so today, we're going to jump into another topic, which is not what we've been talking about for Perspective 4. So for those who've been following me, you know, we've been going through different levels of perspective on how to understand your, your organization. And we've been talking about business rules. And you, normally, I would have our special guest speak on the topic that we're actually talking about in the blog. However, I felt that, especially in today's environment, and as a hot topic that Robert has a lot of knowledge on, I wanted to switch it up a little bit and give a little bit of a bonus and talk about process mining and process automation, because those are two hot topics right now in the industry. And of course, my great friend here has a lot of insight and knowledge on that because he works in this domain all day, every day with people all around the world. So. Robert, thank you for taking this on and coming to be with us another month and sharing some knowledge on two topics that are quite hot in the industry right now. I appreciate it, Paula. Thank you so much for, for having me. I always enjoy talking to you as well. Yep. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so let's jump right in, shall we? Let's first talk about, we talked about two topics, right? Process mining and process automation. So let's first start with process mining. So what is process mining? How would you define that? Um, well, so, and that, that's a great question. So there's a lot of, I guess, confusion around what process mining is and what it is not. And that's that. So that's really thing. So let's kind of talk about what process mining is not first off. And that is that it is not a shortcut to understanding your process. So we talk a lot of customers and, and we do. One of the first questions they ask is, you know, so I want to understand my process. Right? I understand that I need to capture my processes but do I really have to draw my processes or render them out, right? And there's no shortcuts, right? So process mining is not a shortcut to understanding or defining your process. You do need to understand what your process is before you can start mining it, right? Because process mining is going to provide you with an underlying amount of detail about your process to help you sort of understand maybe some of the nuances, but you need to have something to baseline it against. 
you need to have something to be able to say, hey, uh, this is what my process or what I think my process is. And then when I'm doing my process mining, it's going to confirm or, well, unconfirm some of that, that information that, that I thought that I knew. The other thing that process mining usually gets confused with also too, and a lot of folks start thinking about, well, it's gonna help me understand my process, but a lot of things with process mining are digging more into the understanding of what systems and interactivity that I have there and less about what the people are doing in that particular process. And so process mining has two different faces. So there's companies that run process mining with the intent of connecting these to your systems and being able to parse through log data files and being able to un help sort of understand system connectivity and what the computers and the systems are doing. And then there's other process mining tools that you might work with that actually sort of plug into your system as it were. And so if you were a you know, maybe a loan agent, uh, for example, at, at a financial services organization, you would click to start the, the process mining tool when you start the process. And then at that particular point, it starts capturing what systems you're interacting with, but more specifically, what activities you're doing. You're going to this field, you're updating this type of information, you're plugging into this particular system. So it is more focused on the human element. And so when folks are looking at process mining, they really need to understand, I guess, or try to identify what about the mining tool that they want to capture. Are you trying to capture the human element of it? Or are you trying to capture more the system interactivity element of it? Because depending upon which mining tool you select, you could end up with two, you know, something that you didn't intend. So, but process mining by definition is something that's using analytics to dig through either my log files or to watch what I'm doing on the system in order to provide me with a better understanding of what's actually being performed in my process. So at a high level, that's, that's really what it is. Wow. Okay. I didn't know it was this involved to be quite honest. And I liked your tidbits of mm -hmm. these are the pitfalls not to fall into. It is not a way to get away from actually understanding your process or document it. Yep. It actually adds more clarity and understanding once you understand what your process is. Right. So there's no shortcut. I love that. So you started to talk about the benefits of process mining. One of it around data analytics, being able to understand the system interactions and things of that nature. What other benefits do you find or, or why do you feel that process mining is so beneficial? Can you add a little bit more to, to what you've already started when you spoke about data analytics? Sure, sure. So when you start thinking about you've captured your process, uh, a lot of the things that businesses have a hard time with is the data side of it, all right? So they understand that, well, I perform a task, and then I hand it to this person, they perform a step, they perform a step, and they perform a step. But the underlying information about a particular process, if I'm gonna start thinking about efficiencies and I'm gonna start thinking about process improvements, they have a hard time quantifying that or, or gathering that level of information. So, you know, how long does a particular task happen to take? What systems did you interact with? to provide, you know, in order to update that information. So process mining provides that level of information for me. It shows me, well, I spent this much time at this activity, I spent this much time at this activity, and I spent this much time at this activity, and shows me really where I'm going to have bottlenecks within my process. Because, you know, quite frankly, I mean, as a, as a business analyst or as a process owner, I'm thinking, well, this activity should only take maybe two or three minutes. And so maybe I put that down there, but that's, that's best case scenario, right? That's, that's assuming that there's nothing else going on in the process and I've got nothing else to do today. And I showed up and I didn't have any hands. So everything just kind of went through on this wonderful, happy path, but believe it or not, life isn't always a happy path, right? So things happen within our organization that pull my attention away from things or you're also assuming that it only takes two or three minutes because I'm a, all of my time, I'm completely dedicated to your process. And in reality, I'm not, I wear a hundred hats. And so I'm, you know, 25% of my time I spend doing this, but the other 75% of the time I'm off doing something else. So your request is sitting here in limbo and process mining uncovers all of that. It shows me what that flow is through a particular process, but it tells me the time of my, or amount of time that I took to provide, to work on those activities as well. It also tells me who, 
is performing those. Because sometimes when we start mapping a process, we don't realize that there are people involved in our process that really are, or that there are people involved in our process that really shouldn't be. Right? So as we start thinking about our, when we start doing mining and we plug these tools in and we start analyzing what, you know, we suddenly see, oh, well, we've got six resources in this department. We're expecting them to kind of roll through. This is the amount of time they spend on average at each activity. But then all of a sudden there's this request over here out of, out of right field that enters the process and you're like, where did that come from? Who's in that department? What are they doing? Why do they have access to the system? So it can uncover, it can also help me uncover, you know, compliance issues within my particular process to understand where, where these groups are performing, but who has access to data. And as you know, you know, in today's world with uh, data security and privacy and all the laws associated with that, organizations need to be really careful with who has access to private information about specific individuals and who has access to which systems. And when auditors show up and they're looking at things, they do want to know, all right, well, this is, this is the process. That's great. But who's actually performing the process and how are you controlling that? Well, process mining can help me with that. It can help me understand, you know, who has access and who's doing what and who shouldn't be doing something that may be doing something within my particular process. It's also giving me the opportunity. There's a lot of folks that are saying, well, performance data on my process. How many transactions are coming through the process? I may not know that. I, I hypothetically know that we get maybe a thousand requests per month, you know, that are, that are showing up here, but I don't really know. I mean, that's a guess. And, and I'm only basing that maybe on the amount of information, you know, for the number of requests that my analysts may have completed during a particular month, right? But how many, how many did they get through? How many did we receive versus got through? What was the average cycle time going through that? So I can get with process mining, I can get real time performance data on how my process is really performing. And I can see who are my top performers within my particular group as well. So Paula, you're, you're a top performer within my group. What are some of the things that you're doing that maybe we can emulate for some of the other folks within our, or within our group in order to help bring them up to the same level as you, um, or, you know, John over here, he's also a top performer, but he's a top performer because we found out that he's actually skipping five steps in her process. So that's the reason he's getting so much through. Um, so we, we can uncover some of those trends uh, associated with the process mining as well. So there's a lot of different benefits that come with process mining. But as I stated at the beginning, it's not where I start, right? I have to understand what my process is to begin with because it's like, well, with mining, you know, or just mining in general. If I was going to go dig for gold in my backyard, I'm more than welcome to do that, but I'm probably not going to find anything, right? Because pr with process mining, I need to understand that there is a process. I need to understand who's involved in that process. And if I'm mining through systems to look for information, I need to understand where they're loaded and what they're doing. So, yeah, I can, I know where to dig. Yeah. So mining is the same way. Yeah. If, if I was going to go mine for gold somewhere, there's a whole team of geologists that are involved. They're doing soil samples. They're doing atmospheric things. They're, they're taking core samples of various things. They don't just dig for the sake of digging and hope that they're gonna find something, right? And mining is the same way. Process mining, you need to understand what your processes are and where they are before you can actually implement mining tools to help you understand the details underneath, underneath the surface. So this is really interesting. You said a couple of interesting things. One that hit me, though, was when you were talking about process mining can help you identify who is working in the process, who mm -hmm. the people are there doing certain activities. So then my question would have been, <clears throat> well, wouldn't you already know that when you're doing your process documentation, especially if you're using swim lanes? Shouldn't you already know? And shouldn't that already have been uncovered? before you get to the deeper mining piece? Or have you found that that is not the case? You, there's always gaps and as you continue to go lower, 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 more granular, you begin to uncover some of those things. Well, you do start to uncover some of those things. There are gaps. I mean, I, a lot of folks, you have to understand, I guess, a lot of folks in your organization, especially when you start thinking about mapping a process, they live and breathe this every day, right? So there's a lot of things that they do intuitively that they don't even really know that they're doing or they're calling someone to get some information about something, but it's not technically documented in your process. It's just something that I do. And so process mining helps me uncover those, those hidden connections that might be within my process you know, and, and helps me understand if I happen to be deviating it from it in some way, shape or form. 
it under, it helps me also understand how often I have to deviate from that process. So, you know, as a general rule, this is my happy path and we follow this, but it seems like, you know, there's a percentage of time that we, we pop up here for some reason and we follow a, a slightly different route. Why is that? All right. Well, that, because that other route may not be documented. A lot of folks, when you're talking about their, their process, they give you their happy path and that's what you end up capturing. Right? This, is, this is the everyday life. You don't understand or you don't capture those things that only happen 5, 10% of the time. But you need to be able to accommodate those and you need to be able to document those in the event, you know, like we're dealing with a pandemic at the moment. You know, right. there's this, well, a process mining tool would not have uncovered for you that you were probably going to have a pandemic next week, right? And you need to have some right. continuity plans in place in order to be able to address that because it's only dealing with this historical information, but when it does occur and now it's here, now you have it, right? You have that information, you understand how things deviated from the normal path and you understand what path you had to take or how you restored service or how the, ch the path changes now as a result of that. So mining can also help sort of understand that level, that layer of detail, those nuances within our process that we don't even think to capture because, well, they just don't happen every, they don't happen enough for us to think about them. And those are the instances the in the incidents that when you get an audit done, those are the ones audit will find. Yeah. It's never those things every that time. are like 95%. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yep, every, every time. Five. Yeah, those five to 10%. Yeah, and, and quite, I mean, and I've been through multiple audits and usually when an auditor shows up, they're not interested in my everyday path because they know that I have that covered or I should, right? So they, they ask me very few questions about my normal everyday life. They want, in, they want to see and understand my exception path and make sure that I have that covered more than they want to focus on my everyday life, right? So, but if this happens, how are you going to address that? Okay, but if this happens, what, how are you going to address that? Well, that only happens, you know, every other Tuesday when the moon is, you know, high and full and, you know, the tide is in, and, you know, and I happen to have won the lottery that day. Yeah, that's great. But what are you going to do <laughs> when that happens, right? I need to understand those deviations. Right, right, right. So from a process mining perspective, can you give me an example where it was very much beneficial for one of your clients where it made a huge difference mm -hmm. and the outcome of it was so great that it just showed the benefit of not only having mining tools, but understanding how to do process mining effectively. Yeah, so there's, I can give you yeah, an example. We're working with uh, a financial institution on the West Coast, they implemented, they were using iGraphics to capture their processes and do their mapping and modeling. But again, getting to some of that underlying data yeah, to, for, they wanna start thinking about doing process improvement and efficiencies. And you've got some hypotheticals, right? You know, I, well, it should take this long, or if we just made this change or that change, but it's all hyper. You need data in order to go with that. And so they implemented a mining solution that was actually looking at the user side of it and less with the system side. So it wasn't mining through log files and looking for system interactivities. It was looking at how the, how the users actually performed their process. And one of the key things with a lot of mining tools, and this is something just as a general rule to make sure that when you're working with a, any mining tool, to make sure that the output that, that it can give you will be something that is not proprietary to their environment by itself, right? Meaning that you can actually export that information out in some way, shape or form or in some format that you can actually then utilize in your process improvement systems, right? In your BPM systems, in your process modeling systems. And so the tool that they were using captured their process for them, but then exported it out in a BPMN format that they could easily then lay over into their process, into the process mapping tool of iGraphics and then do a comparison, right? Say, so this is what we think we do. And according to the mining tool, this is what we really do. And then overlaying them together, they could see where they had variation uh, within their particular process. They can see different groups that were involved in their process that they didn't know. And so this helped them to address some compliance issues, as I mentioned before, but it also helped them to understand how long or where bottlenecks were occurring within their process. 
we understand that when we send something to this particular group that for whatever reason it's getting hung up there and it's spending an, just an obscene amount of time in this particular activity when we don't think that it should. And the reason for that was just because of the communication layer really between the two, between the two groups, because there really wasn't one. It was just, you took it, you dropped it in a box and left it there for them. So process mining helped them to identify potential areas of automation, which we'll talk about later on, where they could implement and streamline the communication stream between the various groups in order to make sure that communication was happening more effectively, and then things could move along within the process. They are also to identify, able to identify in that, that they had multiple groups seeming to perform similar activities. And did they really need that, All right? So they, they were able to identify redundancy happening within their, within their process as well, because one group did something, then they handed it off to group B, and then group B proceeded to do exactly what group A had just done just before they handed it to them. <laughs> so, but they, you know, and it wasn't really a, a spot check. I mean, they were literally like doing the work again. And so it wasn't just a wow. confirmation. So it helped them to eliminate an entire activity, you know, out of the process, which, you know, if they're spending two hours doing it, they're spending two hours doing it. Yeah, I just cut that time in half and we're moving. We've got great efficiency running through there. And I don't need the resources on one of those particular activities. I just freed up somebody's, somebody's time. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, awesome! That's, Great that's, example. That's one case scenario. So there's, but there's a there's a variety of different organizations we've worked with that are using mining to uncover a variety of different things, and some of those being same similar aspects to what we're looking there. Whether it be looking for process efficiencies, looking for redundancies, baselining, looking for performance measures, or helping them to identify where there's potential for at least an automation conversation. Okay. Do you have any examples or recommendations for mining tools that you think work really, really well? Well, there, there's a variety of different mining tools, like I said before, and it really depends upon what it is that you're trying to go for, right? So mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the different types of data, but there, there's, you know, the big ones, you know, on the, on the block you know, that everybody sort of familiar with, and then there's other smaller ones. And I don't really, I guess, endorse one particular mining company, you know, over, over another. You know, we have relationships with uh, like companies like Lana Labs and My Invideo. And then uh, there's other companies like Stereo Logic that are more on the customer facing side and less digging into the, to the log files. Lana Labs, Comunda, and those guys, they, they typically focus, they're more on system log information and less on user interface. Uh, interactions and then other companies like, like I said, like Stereo Logic or more are focused on how users are performing the process and less about what the systems are doing. Okay. So. Perfect. So, what is the difference between process automation and process mining? Let's move into the automation um, <laughs> aspect of it. What is this thing called process automation? Well, well, for, well, we we know that process mining isn't automation, right? Because it's not automating anything. The only thing it's doing is sort of monitoring and going through the individual systems and showing you how you work and providing you with some data elements. And it's providing you with some information on where you might have bottlenecks or issues within your process or redundancy issues within your process uh, that you can that you can somehow circumvent. Now, automation, you get into a few different layers because automation is a big is a big thing as well. And there's different types of automation, just like there's different types of mining tools. You know, we talked about like data mining versus process mining, uh, you know, information, system mining information versus uh, when we get into automation, now we start thinking about like robotic process automation. We start thinking about like workflow automation, which also might be considered like a human in the middle uh, kind, you know, aspect of it, human workflow automation. Um, and then there's just straight up, you know, like big automation. Right? We start thinking about you know things where basically the HAL and the, the, the T1000s of the world that are going to take over and realize that we're you know a danger to ourselves and you know try to you know, take over AI and all that other stuff. So whatever all the right, right. Theories, right, that, that kick in, automation starts developing itself. So you know that so there's the, there's the, the full on automation where there's no people involved. The systems are making all of the decisions and they're building everything for themselves most people aren't ready for that right i mean they for for work, there there are things that you can fully that you can fully automate but people are always a part of automation and that's 
something that a lot of folks have a hard time understanding or where they have a they have a hang up right because they think if they automate something well if we automate that or i implement rpa into something robotic process automation into something then you know i'm going to lose my job because we automated that and that's not always the case As a matter of fact if if anything in most cases automation helps to enhance or supplement your job right because it's making you more efficient at what it is that you need to do or it's allowing you to actually do the job that i hired you to do rather than some of the the day-to-day -day menial things that i don't really want you focusing on so let's kind of break them down a little bit into the different types all right so first robotic process automation robotic process automation is very much once i understand my process and this is the other key thing for all automation components as well. We talked about this for process mining, how understanding my process was key. We talked about this in our last episode too. The yeah, process is the center of everything we do and we need to understand that before we can move into anything else. And automation is the same way. Before you can move into automation, you really do need to understand what your process is to begin with. Because automation is you're using systems, you're using computers, and you have to be able to tell the computer what to do. And in order to be able to tell the computer or program the computer with what to do, you have to know what you're telling it to do, which is, well, that's your process, right? So the, um, you have to be able to understand that or break that down. So a lot of people think, like I said, with regards to RPA, that it's, there's, there's a few myths that we wanna, I guess, bust first when it comes to automation of any kind, and that, that it's about reducing FTE count. Uh, because it's not always about reducing FTE. Um, there can be certain gains, obviously. There can be certain reductions in FTE, but in a lot of cases, what it's doing, as I mentioned before, is freeing people up to actually focus on the jobs that we hired them to do. Or I might be in a position where my company has grown to a certain, to a certain point that I need to hire more people, and throwing people at it isn't the answer. Right. I, I, I just don't have the funds to throw people at it. I mean, I, that, that's not the answer to the question. So I have to figure out a way to make the people more efficient at doing what they're doing their jobs or provide some capability within here that might supplement them in such a way that it will be like I hired more people. So it's right. it, it might seem like it's a reduction in FTE, but you know, I currently have five people performing this particular task or this particular job. Once I automate a particular task, now they've become so much more efficient that it's like having 10 people doing that particular job. So is there a reduction in FTE? No, there's not, but it will, it might seem like that, right? Because technically before you would have hired five more people, but you just, you can't afford that. So it's not always about reducing FTE. It's also not only about cost savings. So, because cost reduction can be achieved with automation, however, it's usually more about improved efficiency, uh, greater accuracy, um, increased compliance. Uh, that's usually where automation is coming into play because it's going to take and it's going to perform the same tasks over and over and over again. ABC, ABC, mm -hmm. ABC. It's going to follow the rules. And so you don't have to worry about compliance issues with automated tasks unless the rules change, right? So. Um, in, in which case you need to go back and you need to fix, you know, or you need to update that automation component to be in line with whatever the new qualifications happen to be. So it can also be about enriching customer experience because things move along at a much more efficient pace. Now customers can put in their requests a lot faster. They can get their product a lot faster, right? So there's, there's thing, it can also go about enhancing customer experience. So it's not always about reducing FTV and it's not about reducing costs. The other misconception is that because it's automated, robots or automation is never wrong. That's another misconception, right? So because bots are only as accurate as the instructions that I gave them, right? So if my process is not right, and this is, an, again, why it's also so crucial to understanding my process first, because if I automate a bad process, I'm going to do bad things a lot faster, right? And that's, that's not going to be what I need. Right. I need to make sure that I understand and that I've done gone through the process efficiency exercises first to identify what updates I need to make there and then identify the automation components. Now, I, I did um, 
speak with a vendor. I was in a room with a vendor one time who said, well, you don't really, you can automate a bad process because with all the time that you will save on the automated, now you can go back and you can fix your process. If you hear that, if any vendor says that, walk away. <laughs> just that's not the vendor you want. All right. I'm, I'm just saying, because there's, there's a little thing called math that just doesn't add up. All right. So if you were able to do something, if it took, if you had five people on your team and you were doing something and you had a bad process and you, and between the five of you, you were creating 10 defects a week. Well, now you've automated that. And a lot of RPA vendors will tell you that they're going to get 50% increase in your productivity or hundred percent increase in your productivity. Well, let's, let's give them the benefit of the doubt, right? Let's just say you got a hundred percent increase in your productivity. Well, now I've got five people that have created, you know, that are creating 10 errors a week. Well, what happens when I automate that? Well, now I'm getting 20 hours, 20 errors a week, right? Before I was getting 40, you know, 40 errors a month. Now I'm getting 80 errors a month. So where are you going to spend your time? Are you going to spend your time fixing your process? Or are you going to spend your time putting out the fires of the defects? You know, so you just freed up your time, yes, to work, to do more rework than you would have had if you had just fixed the process to begin with. So don't think that automation can't be wrong because you automated. You need to understand what your process is first. You also need to understand that if the rules change, you need to update mm -hmm. your automation, right? So it will do ABC, ABC, like I said before, but if the rules change and you need to go ABD, ABD, you need to tell the, the automation that that's the case. Otherwise it will continue doing ABC and you'll end up with all kinds of errors, rework and potential compliance issues. So that's one of the things I guess when it comes to like RBA, RPA. So the objective really with any automation um, is it necessarily cost savings or reduced FTE? You will and can potentially gain those things. That is true. But really what you're looking for is increased efficiency. You're looking for improved compliance. You're looking for a reduction in, say, monotonous work that needs to be done, say, some of that swivel chair activity that RPA is excellent for because it takes or can take an, a lot of money to figure out how to integrate two systems. Right? So I've got data over here and I need to be able to figure out how to integrate them so that the data comes across. But RPA is relatively, by comparison, inexpensive to just create an RPA, a digital worker that literally just copies information from here and enters it in here and, and does that data entry for me. So it can reduce a lot of that monotonous work, that swivel chair type activity that I'm not necessarily paying you to do. Right? I'm paying you to process loans, not enter loan applications. We already got that. You use two different systems for it. So here, here, done. Mm -hmm. But you will, like I said, by extension, get reduced cost. You will, by extension, potentially reduce FTD. But you will definitely improve customer experience. You will lower risk. You will improve the accuracy of your process being performed and improve compliance. Now, that said, I guess, um, there's things that we need to consider when we start thinking about automation and specifically RPA to define whether or not something is a candidate for RPA to begin with. And so we need to understand our process, but if our, if our process is extremely complex, if there's a lot of decision points that are happening within there, if there's a lot of variation that happens within there, if there's a lot of rules that have to be performed and that I have to look at, that's not a candidate for RPA. You can't, you can't look at RPA and address that. RPA is about doing simple tasks. It's not about making a lot of decisions. It's not about, you know, interacting with a whole lot of systems. I can take information from here and put it in here, but if I have to take some here and there and maybe there, I'm going to run into problems, right? So under, I need to understand the rules. Mm -hmm. I should also think about stability uh, of that particular process. How likely is this process to change? I've worked in organizations, and I know you, you have too, Paula, where, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's fine if you don't like the process, just wait a week, right? Because it's probably going to change. So, right. the, uh, so that process has to be stable. I mean, you don't want to go through the effort of, of automating something because automation, contrary to what any 
vendor, RPA or otherwise, will tell you automation, RPA, workflow, it's not, it's not an inexpensive endeavor. Right? It does take money and time and cost and projects and, you know, to get that stuff done. So you need to, you need to consider that and you don't want to have to have a whole lot of rework that's going into it. So you want your, your, your process really to have, have settled and be stable and not, not going to be subject to a whole lot of change. And there, there's other things to, to consider that are in there as well. And that just dealing with strategic alignment. So there's visibility that needs to happen within my, within those processes as well. So you need to have some mechanism in place to not just capture that complexity and the durations of time that mining might give to you or the people that are involved, the FTE counts that mining or your systems might give to you or the systems that you interact with, but you also need a mechanism in place to look at your organization and make the determination of whether or not this is something that's strategically viable. You know, mm -hmm. it's not, it's not my personal science project. This is actually, aligned with some strategic goal because if it's not i'm not going to get funding for it it's it's going to be a really right. hard conversation to push that to push that up the mountain uh, in order to get funding for my project in order to get resources assigned and you know I, so it needs to be it needs to be strategically aligned so you need a mechanism to see that too so just some things i guess to consider when it comes to, to rpa and for, for um robotic process automation or really any automation component then there is the, the workflow automation piece. Right? So we talked about robotic process automation, which is all about systems, right? But some things are too complicated for robotic process automation that then we now kind of work more with human-centric uh, workflow automation. So there are certain tasks within here that are automated. Uh, maybe I'm using pieces of RPA for that. Uh, I might be using other full-on automation for that, but at some point, maybe I hit a rule. Um, I, I'll give you an example, right? Because we've been using financial services up to this particular point in time, we'll just kind of stick with that. All right, so okay. somebody's, somebody's requesting a loan, all right? And RPA or automation systems uh, in general, so RPA will take their loan application out of their PDF or whatever they send it in, it'll plug it into the system for me and now I've got that and then it then automation actually kicks in and starts doing some math, starts looking at rules. It starts combing various systems. Well, what's your credit report? What's your credit score? How much are you asking for? You know, various, various factors. And so it's got a whole set of rules that it's going to go through and automation can do that. RPA can't, but full on automation can, it can look through that decision set, but it's also then has decision points or nodes within there where it needs to follow a different path, right? If your credit score, let's say you're asking for less than $10,000 and your credit score is 800, right? Well, I'll auto approve you, right? I don't need to get anybody else involved in that. And that's how you generally, if you call to get a credit card, you know, the system, it takes it, what, 30 seconds to process your whole request and you get an answer, right? It says, hey, congratulations, you've got a credit limit of. And so, but that's, that's all that automated system is doing. Right. It's just you know, what's your credit score. And then based on that and maybe some historical information, or if you're asking for a loan, is it under this amount approved or not? But if your credit score is say less than 800 or maybe it's below 700 and say, I mean, you got a, a, your credit score kicks out to be 680 and you're asking for $10,000. Well, I'm not going to automatically dis disqualify you per se, but I'm going to kick you into a decision tree where now a loan officer is going to look at it and see if there's some underlying reason why you should be approved, all right? So this is where this work, this human in the middle, human-centric piece kicks in. There are certain pieces that people have to do and other things that systems will do. So a computer will take it to a point, but when it can't, it needs a human there to be able to interact with in order to be able to understand what path it should take going there. Now, once I kick it over to you and you look at it, if you say, all right, well, I've looked at it and he appears to be okay, well, you might kick it right back into the automation path again, and now it picks up from there. Or you say no, and then it kicks into the automation path that sends me the nice letter that says, thanks for applying. No. So, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, uh, but there, so there's different aspects of it, but workflow automation requires people to be involved in it. Certain steps are, are automated until it, until it can't be, and I need somebody, a human, to make a decision, and then it kicks it otherwise. And then there's full-on automation, which is just the systems doing what they do, right? Until they break, and then they throw an alert that says the system's not working. You think about a 
uh, like true robotics, a fully automated assembly line at a car plant, for example. There's people walking around, but all the machines are moving the pieces in and parts out. You know, now if one of the machines hangs, somebody's going to come over and fix it. But otherwise, the machine is doing what it needs to do. So, or making full-on sort of business decisions for where we need to go. But that's uh, when we start delving into the when we get start getting into full automation, we all start start delving into the the newer aspects of artificial intelligence and machine learning and how it's using some of those data analytics to look at historical trends and then sort of forecast or predict out what's going to be happening in the future based on that. So um, mm -hmm. that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> Perfect. So you pretty much told us what process automation is, the benefits of it, and how to approach it, the types that are out there, where you might use those types, when you shouldn't use those types. So you, you went into it to a lot there. But as you've worked with clients, and you've worked with many, mm -hmm. what have you found to be the biggest challenge <clears throat> for organizations to leverage these techniques, process mining and process automation? Clearly, they're beneficial. Right. Clearly, they're needed. And clearly, it gives you clarity on what's actually going on in your organization. Mm -hmm. to help increase process efficiencies, customer experience, lessen your risk so that you're in compliance or at least have controls in place to keep that risk pretty much uh, mitigated. So what have you found to be the biggest challenges with organizations? Is it that they want to bypass understanding the process and go right into mining and automation without having that clear understanding of the process? Or is it other, other loopholes or pitfalls that we should probably avoid if we want to implement these two techniques yeah well you you hit a big nail on the head there first so one of the the first issues that generally arise is just trying to expedite and circumvent the process right? piece understanding of the process you that's that's really fundamental and you need to understand that before you can implement any of the other solutions we've talked about today whether that be mining for process mining for your systems for data or for the per people aspect of it or any of the automation components, you need to understand the process first. If you don't understand the process, then it's a waste of time, effort, and money really to do any of the other, the other components. Because you're going to spin your wheels, and you, there's a there's a very good chance, more likely than not, you're not going to get the results. Right? And a lot of that is driven by a variety of different factors, and so it becomes one of the challenges just executive understanding of it, and that's understanding what's involved and getting that done and setting realistic time frames for that right because you know an executive up on high sets a strategic direction says hey we're gonna implement rpa you know this quarter awesome right but, you know what's where should we be focusing you know um and we're going to do it this quarter is that even a realistic time frame if we don't even understand where we're beginning right we you know there's a whole lot right. of things that so we need to know, you know, have some strategic guidance on that. And we need to understand what we're implementing and why we're implementing it. And then need to understand what the process is and identify realistic expectations for what we're going to get from it. Right. Uh, and, and then define another challenge is typically having people have pre-identified what, what success means. Right. And this is this happens even outside of this this particular space. Right. If I'm thinking about process improvements in general or before I start implementing anything within my organization, how do I prove that what I did was of value? What you know, how do I how am I going to justify or show success or prove success? What is my ROI, my value prop, whatever it is that I need to that I need to identify here that says that when I got done with this, is it simply to check that I implemented a digital worker? Right. That I implemented a bot, because if that's it. I can do that this week, right? If, if that's all the criteria is. But chances are, you're not gonna see actual in, any benefit from that, right? And, and, and when you do that, then you're gonna say, well, we implemented RPA and we didn't really see any gains from it. And now the whole system transformation, all your transformation products start to crumble because you didn't set realistic expectations from the beginning of timeframes and how to measure success. So those are like two of the biggest you know, things right there is identifying process, 
setting realistic expectations and having them be actually strategically aligned, you know, identifying what your goals are from the beginning rather than just saying, we're going to implement automation. That's too broad. It needs to be specific. Makes sense. But that's what we find a lot, period, right? When we're, <laughs> when we're yeah. working on projects, initiatives, process, you know, we get, so this is what we're going to do. Okay. So how are we going to go about it? What is our focus? What is the scope? What is the timeline? And then really having those honest, transparent conversations on what's doable or what's not doable. Because yeah. I think a lot of people don't like to push back as well. And you have to push back. You have to say, right. based on what you want us to accomplish, we're not going to get this done in one quarter. Mm -hmm. It might take us an entire year. Right. That might be not what you want to hear. But if you really want this done well and with quality, that's the reality. That's what we are dealing with based on where we are right now in, in the company. And so that is a common theme that I see across the board. And I always hear people talk about when right. it comes to support and setting realistic expectations and actually just defining what those expectations are to begin with. So it makes total sense that that would be here as well. Yeah, and understanding the why, right? I mean, that's really the... Yeah, we're going to implement this, but why are we doing it? Yeah, this this is our strategic reason for doing this, and it's answering that why provides mm -hmm. the context for most of the other things. Exactly, and then not just answering it, but can we communicate it down to everybody who's going to be involved so everybody understands why we're doing it? Because yeah. uh, there's a lot of times people are involved in projects and initiatives. They're not given that why. They're just told this is what you have to do. Right. And, you know, with any decision that we make in life, I think most people want to know why we're making that decision in life. So why should it be any different in your work environment? Right. And, and especially for the topics that we've talked about today with process automation and with process mining, because of the misconceptions or a lot of the, the at least the preconceived notions that are associated with it of how it's going to affect me or my job or potentially the loss of it, I really need to make sure that that information gets communicated out effectively because it's a fundamental shift in thinking and in culture within an organization to when they go about adopting these particular principles uh, of, uh, and using these tools. This is, you know, and you will get pushback if, if you don't get, and, and if everybody's not on board, it's going to stall at some point rather rolling up the hill or trying to come down it. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Well, Robert, thank you. This was another great session. I'm going to have to have you back to talk about something. I don't know what yet, but I'm going to have to <laughs> have you back to talk about something next year. We're going to have to work on that. Come up with something fun and different yeah, that we'll, people wouldn't expect to talk about. We'll, we'll, we'll brainstorm. I'm sure we can come up with something to talk about. It's just, yeah. Yes. Or maybe even do maybe a live session, maybe do some demos next year on, okay, how do you create processes? Or how do you actually go about and you do this? Maybe actually do some sort of like a workshop sort of thing and have yeah, some fun with that. Workshop could be fun. You can invite, uh, you've had a couple of sessions up till now. You could have a, uh, we could run some panels, right? You get uh, get more than one person kind of rolling through some, some topics. I'm sure people get that. That's not a bad idea. That might be fun too. Yeah. Maybe get some spirited debate. Maybe hear some, yeah, that sounds great, but I don't agree with that. This is what we yeah. do. I, there's nothing wrong with that. Get other yeah. perspectives. I hear that might be saying. something we yeah. do. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, but I don't agree with you at all. Yeah. True, true, true. Yeah. Well, thank you again for sharing all of your knowledge with us. Great, great session. I learned a lot in this session, too. So now I feel like I even have more knowledge. So I feel like a ninja well, process at this point, a different layers of process. And I hope everyone who's listening has found this episode helpful as well. Um, I look forward to wrapping up Perspective 4, which is about business rules and now process mining and automation at the end of this month and kick into Perspective 5, which is all about systems in uh, September. So that one, that one should be fun. But until then, where I'm going to sign off for now, Thank you, everyone, for joining the BA Martial Artist. And Robert, once again, thank you for sharing all of your knowledge. I greatly appreciate it. And I can't wait to have you back on whatever we do, because I know whatever we do is going to be phenomenal. Yeah, thank you, Paul. It was always, always fun to be with you. Thank you. Until next time, everyone.